Okay. Um, did everybody get a chance to kind of skim through the book in terms of the steps that we need to go through to assign the exact, what we call the exact configuration of a chiral center? probably do some examples right right so what do we what's our goal I'm gonna go back to the slide that I had that I had yesterday there's there's two ways to describe a chiral molecule one at the molecule level and one at each chiral center level the, we talked yesterday about the rotation of plane polarized light positively or negatively. That's the way to describe which enantiomer you have at the molecular level, at the entire molecule level. So a molecule, if you have two enantiomers, one will be D, one will be L, and it doesn't matter how many chiral centers it has. They'll be mirror images of each other. So one's D and one's L. But at the chiral center level, we have to define what the exact three-dimensional structure is around that by using R and S. So we'll start with a single chiral center, and then you have to apply that, those rules to every single chiral center in the molecule. And those, and those are either R or S. But for these molecules that have a single chiral center, there's no relationship between whether the chiral center is R or S and whether the overall molecule is D or L. So when you do the when you do these experiments in lab where and you're going to look at two different chiral molecules, one you're going to do by yeast reduction, I believe. In the other one, you'll pull the naproxen sodium out of a, a leaf tablet. The naproxen sodium is going to be, I believe, negative to start with. It's going to be L. But just because I know it's L doesn't mean that I know whether the chiral center in it is R or S. I have to actually take the L molecule and then do X-ray diffraction to figure out whether it's RRS. So we need a previous connection. And the same thing is going to be true when you do the yeast reduction and make that chiral molecule. So how do we determine R and S? And let's, let's start with let's start with A here. Um, so we got a bromine methyl chlorine OH. Bromine Bromine, methyl, chlorine, and OH. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've got now what I have to do in my first step is I've got to assign these four groups with four different numbers, from number one being the highest priority to number four being the lowest priority. And so it's a numbers game. And what am I going to look at first? I'm going to look at the atom that's directly attached to the chiral center. So I'm going to look at the bromine versus carbon versus chlorine versus oxygen. And, and now I'm going to apply my con pre prelog sequence rules, which can be used for another, which can be used for another um, naming issue with alkenes. But we're gonna, we'll start with it here. So the first thing is, I'm gonna look at the atomic number of each of those atoms, and the molecule with the highest atomic number wins. If it's a tie, amongst the atomic numbers. So in other words, if I have isotopes, then the higher mass isotope wins. So when I look at these, which, which group it has, or which atom of bromine, carbon, chlorine, and O 
which one has the highest atomic number. Bromine. So bromine is going to be the number one group. Then what's next? Chlorine, then and then then carbon. So that's that's the first step. The first step is always is always going to be to assign is to start with the atoms that are attached to the chiral center. So in this case, there's no ties. We, we've gone through and we've easily gone one, two, three, four. Okay. So that's our first step. Always is one, two, three, four. And then we're going to come back in a minute and we're going to say, okay, now what's the second step? So this is, again, just the first step. So now the question is ties. How do we break ties? So let's look at let's look at number B here. This this B molecule. And these are from the homework problems that I believe I, I don't know if I did I make copies of them? No, I don't think they're in the folder, but I don't think I made copies of them. I'll try and see if I can do that. Okay, so we've got a CH2, CH2, OH up here. I've got a C double bond O. And then I've got a CH2, CH2 I which I'm going to change. I'm going to make it just a CH2I. In this case, instead of having two CH2s, and then I'm going to have a CH2SH. So, CH2CH2OH. A C double bond O C L, an I with a C H two, and then an S H with a C H two. Now I just ramped up from. We can do this. We can assign one, two, three, four in one step, to probably assigning the. I just put it here as well. So. Now we're gonna now we're now we're gonna ramp up and we're gonna have to do like two or three things here to break ties. So what is I'm again gonna look for carbon versus carbon versus carbon versus carbon. So now what I have is now I'm in a position where I've got what? I've got four carbons. I know. Like a little early for that, but so we've got four carbons here, so all of them are tied. So now what I'm going to do to break the tie is... Well, I'm going to manage it up, but I'm not going to work the, the I, the I, the I one has two carbons. I know, I changed it to make this problem a little bit different. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've modified that problem. I've modified that problem a little bit. So I got four carbons, they're all tied, so now what am I gonna do? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the four, there are the three atoms that are attached to each of those carbons. That's my next step. So what's attached to, what's attached to the top CH2 here? Two H's and a C. So these two H's and that C. So that's what's attached to that carbon. Two H's and a C. Down here, what's attached to that carbon? Two H's and an S. So two H's and an S. What's attached over here? T 
two, two H's and an I. And then what's uh, attached over here? A chlorine and an oxygen. So once I determine then what's attached, now if, if these weren't all four carbons, if one of these was an oxygen, it would win first place automatically and then I would do the other three. But in this case, they're all tied, so I've got I've to look at the tiebreaker for all four of those. So what I'm going to do is, the way the Conningle prelog sequence rules are, is it's the singular atom that has the highest atomic number wins for that group. So I would look at this and say, okay, I've got a hydrogen, a carbon, I've already taken account, I've got a hydrogen, a carbon, a sulfur, and an iodine and an oxygen in the chlorine. Of that collection of atoms, is there one that has clearly the highest atomic number? Yeah. Iodine. So in this case, the iodine wins. So we're looking at all of the atoms the collection of atoms and looking for the singular atom that has the highest atomic number. There's one thing that we never do, but I'm not going to say what we never do, although I'll hint at it, that we never do. But it's always the singular atom. So one iodine beats three chlorines. One iodine beats three oxygens. It beats an oxygen and a chlorine. Right. So you're, you're looking for, at this point, once you identify the chiral carbons, you're looking for the group that has the highest priority. Priority which is based on the atomic number. Which is going to be based on the series of, of rules. Okay. So here's my chiral center, and I've got to take, and I've got to assign one, two, three, and four to these four groups. Car I, first thing I do is look at the atoms that are attached to this chiral sign. Carbon, 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 they're tied. Now I'm going to look at, for each one of those carbons, what's attached to it. Two H's and an O, two H's and an S, two H's and an I, and right now a CL and an O. And so then I'm going to look at the collection of atoms, and if there's an atom that singularly has the highest atomic number, it wins. And then I'm going to look for the atom that might have the next highest. Now, if two of the groups have iodines, they're tied, so then I'm going to look at the remaining atoms in those in that two, those two groups. And if there's one that has a higher priority over the other, then that wins. So if I had like an H, an O, and an I versus two H's and an I, the I's tie, but the O beats the H. Okay. So it's, but what we're doing is singular atoms. We're not we're never adding stuff. You never add stuff together. It's the singular atom. So in this case, this group with the iodine is going to be our number one group. Except we have an issue. And the issue that we have is that all of the three groups with the H's and the S, I, and C all have four atoms attached to the carbon, whereas the carbon-oxygen double bond only has two atoms. And that's not a fair comparison. It's not fair to compare a group that has three atoms attached to a group that only has two atoms attached. So what they, so what the Conningle prelog people said is, well, when you have a multiple bond, you need to create a structure that is totally unreal, but it will now give us four atoms, or three atoms attached to that, to that group. So here's how we handle multiple bonds. If, for instance, you had a carbon-carbon double bond, let's say that was attached to the chiral center over here. I need to replace this double bond with a phantom structure, a structure that only is existing 
to be used in the conjugal prelong sequence rules. It has no physical reality to it. But I need to somehow have that carbon to have three things attached to it, not just two. Right now, it just has a hydrogen and a carbon. So what we do is we take that structure and we basically erase the double bond, right? But if we're going to erase the double bond, then what I'm going to do is I'm now going to replace that double bond with the two CC single bonds. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to replace this carbon-carbon double bond with two carbon-carbon single bonds. So this carbon was involved in the double bond. It now has one. And now I'm going to add a second carbon-carbon single bond to it. But then this carbon was also involved in the double bond. And so now I'm going to replace it with two CC single bond. So here's the first CC single bond. There's the second CC single bond. So what I did was I replaced the carbon-carbon double bond so that now each of those two carbons that were involved in it have now have one, two carbon, carbon single bonds. And so now what's happened is, is that all the atoms that only had three things attached to it now have four. And this is what's called an equivalent structure. So what I just did was, was drew an equivalent structure for that carbon-carbon double bond. It doesn't exist. It's not real. It's just used for conningle prelog sequence rules. So now we can look at this carbon and say, oh, that carbon has two C's and an H. It's got three things attached to it. Now it's fair game. Now I can compare it to other groups that have three things attached to it. Does that kind of make sense? Nobody's really nodding their head, Brent. So when you're doing the equivalent structure, you're pretty much just breaking all the bonds down into single bonds. Right, and, we're, and I'm erasing I'm erasing the double bond, and then I'm replacing it with an equivalent number of single bonds. So, so, so I write the structure, I erase this, and then I say, well, that was a CC double bond, so here's one CC single bond, here's a second one, in the place where there was no bond before. And then this is in a double bond, so this one gets one, two, CC single bonds. Now, if there's not like a double bond to use, Like what if you only literally have two groups and there's not like a double bond? Well, you can't have that. Because it's carbon, so you can't have a carbon with three bonds without having it having a positive charge. And we would never name something with, or we, you can't have a chiral center with a positive charge. So it's got to have a multiple bond if it only has three things attached to it. When it's also with the triple bond. Yep, so if we did a triple bond, if I wanted to, to do the triple bond, What would what would that what would the equivalent structure of the triple bond be? I would again, I'm going to write that without the triple bond. For the first carbon, it's involved in the CC triple bond, so it's going to get one, two, three single bonds, and then for the second one, it's going to get one two, three, single bonds. And so this would be the equivalent structure for a CC triple bond. So that means the first carbon has three carbons attached to it. Now you might say and we haven't had to go, and we're starting out here, and we're increasing difficulty. Eventually, what happens if two groups are tied and they have the same groups attached to them? Then you have to look at the groups that are attached to that carbon. So what would happen if I all of a sudden had to 
had to look at this group because there's nothing there, it's assumed that there's three hydrogens there. So if I was comparing that to some other carbon, I'm assuming that all those carbons that don't have hydrogens, they've got three hydrogens. We don't necessarily always go that far. So when we're looking through things, like for example, the carbon core and the double bond PO, when we make our list, can we just automatically assume when we see a double bond, we can just go up to the very clearly and so, so let's so let's do that one. So, what would the equivalent of the C double bond O C L be? So, I'm going to replace this. First of all, I write the structure which is single bonds. I'm going to replace the double bond with two C O single bonds. So that means this carbon is going to have a second C O single bond. So it has the original one. And now it's got a new one. But what I should remember is that this OC double bond, that this OC double bond, that carbon needs to have two OC single bonds. So the true equivalent structure for the C, C double bond CL is going to be that. So I replace the... I replace this CO double bond from the carbon end with two single bonds and from the oxygen end with two OC single bonds. Makes this make sense? So then that carbon then is what? This carbon doesn't just have a CL and an O, it's got a Cl, O, and another O. I'm only so when I so now I'm back to where I was at the beginning. Okay. I'm looking at the carbon that's attached to this. What's attached to that carbon? Now in the expanded structure, two O's and a Cl. So I have to expand it out in order to get the three group, the three atoms that are attached to that carbon. That's where we went on this little diversion because originally I only had two atoms there, and I really can't compare two atoms to three atoms. So I've got to write the equivalent structure. So those are the equivalent structures, and we have to use those with multiple bonds. So years and years and years ago, when we weren't even in this building, we were in an old building that's now a parking lot, one of the, the students would come in, they, they would say the guy I taught organic with was Dr. Weaver, who forgot more chemistry than I will ever know. And he, they came in, they said, Dr. Weaver's talking about phantom carbons. And I'm like, okay, what are phantom carbons? Because he would get off on tangents as well. And I'm like, phantom carbons? What are phantom carbons? Then I'm like, what are you talking about? RMS. Oh, okay. He's talking about the fact that these equivalent structures aren't real. So you're putting in phantom atoms. And the only reason you're doing that is to make the conical pre life sequence rules work. That's the only reason you're doing it. There's no physical reality here. It's a game in order to get a fair comparison between three atoms and another three atoms. We, we have more problems here, so we have more multiple bonds we can work with. But does this sequence kind of make sense in terms of how to, how to write it? So did that change my iodine, my CH2 iodine being the number one group? No, because again, it's the singular atom. Iodine beats a Cl, an O, and another O. Because it's the singular atom. So that's so the iodine group was number one. Now, if we look at the atoms that are left, an H, an S, an H, a C, and a Cl, and two Os, is there an atom there that is clearly the highest? atomic number. 
that's left. The CL. So the CL wins the priority for that group. So the C double bond CL is now the number two group. And then what about the CH2S versus the CH2C? It's basically boiled down to S versus C. And so S wins that, so this is number three. And then that group is number four in terms of the priorities. This is a step one. But step one is assigning one, two, three, four priorities to the four groups. What happens if two groups are tied? And I can't break the tie. Then that means two groups are the same. And if you have two groups of the same, you can't have a chiral center. I'm confused why we need to make a placement structure if it doesn't matter how many atoms are on Because in this case, it didn't matter. But in future cases, it might. So let's so let's say for the sake of let's say for the sake of argument here, let me go ahead here, and let's say I had a C double bond C, and over here I had a CH. Is that the one I want? I'm going to probably get in trouble here, but let's. Let's say I'm comparing those two groups. So then I would say, well, what's attached to this car? First of all, I gotta always go back to the beginning. Carbon versus carbon tied. What's attached to this carbon? What's attached to this isopropyl group? What's attached to that carbon is what? Two C's and an H. What's attached to that carbon? Right now it is 1C1H, but that's not a fair comparison, right? So I've got to put it into its expanded structure. So I've got to write the molecule, write the group with just single bonds, and then this carbon gets one, two carbon-carbon single bonds. This carbon over here that's involved in the double bond gets one, two carbon-carbon single bonds. So that's the equivalent structure. So what's now attached to this carbon? Two carbons and an H. And so what happens? We're tied. So those two groups have the same atoms attached to them. So now what do I do? Now I go to the next group that's attached to that carbon. So right here, I'm now going to see well what's attached what's attached to this carbon what's attached to that carbon versus down here what's attached to this carbon and what's attached to that carbon and see this is where it gets kind of complicated so when I look at this I say well what's attached to this group three H's. What's attached, well, sorry, I should take a step back. Look at the atoms first. Carbon versus carbon. Over here I've got a carbon versus another carbon, so they're tied. They're still tied. If one of those would have been an oxygen, it would have won. So now I've got to look at those two carbon groups and I have to say, well, what's attached to those? So what's attached to this carbon group is three H's. What's attached to this carbon group is three H's. Up here, what's attached to this carbon group? Again, as I said before, the default is that those are hydrogens, so basically three H's. What's attached to this carbon group over here? Well, what I'm doing is I'm looking here because these two carbons 
because this carbon is these two car these two carbons are attached to the same carbon. So what I'm doing is I'm looking beyond I'm looking sort of beyond. So what I've got here is I've got what? Two H's and a C. So now it's a two H's and a C versus three H's. Which one wins? And so this group would be, let's say, the number one group, and then this group would be number two. So that's why we have to do the expanded structure, because in the first case it didn't matter, but in this case, that's why it gets the priority. So we have to, so we have to take our rules by looking at the atom and then expanding it into what's attached to that atom. So if I had those two groups, C double bond, C with the H2, versus a CH2, CH2I. So my question is, which one of those two groups has the higher priority? and they can't be tied. So we'll, we'll vote my card. And I have to get you your card. I'll go back to the office at the break here and grab you a card. So you can, if you want, you can go one or two for A or B. Because I don't think anybody's gonna be looking back at you looking at your answer. But these cards make it anonymous. Do we have a do we have a vote in terms of which one has higher priority? All right, what's up? Question number two. Okay, A or B. We have a six to four vote. Well, I should tell you that, right? We just have a six to four vote. Because what? Because then the next step is to do this: is to say, okay, discuss with somebody close, somebody close by you, 
won't I won't make you break up into groups yet. But discuss with somebody by you what you voted and why, and I'll give you a minute or so to do that, and then we will, and then we will revote. Actually, we have a seven to four vote, but still. So take a minute and discuss and like if you, you know, you can discuss across tables and then we'll re-vote. So if you're convinced, somebody convinces you that, their, that theirs was correct, go ahead and do that. Are we ready to revote? Are we ready to revote? Yes. Okay. Alright, then so let's revote. Let's see if there's a change. Okay, let's see, what was the, what was the change? Wait, where, where did the vote go? We got 11 votes for A. So either you're all right or you're all wrong. And you're right. So, so tell me, so where, if you had B, why did you have B to begin with? And why is that not right? Go ahead. Just about the fact that I wasn't connected to the first apartment. But really, I like looked at the structure and I circled like all the ones that were like directly connected. And A had two C's as opposed to one C. Okay. So when I give you these problems, and I don't even have to work that hard sometimes. When you see an iodine or a chlorine or an oxygen, the initial temptation is, that's it. Because you see it, it's a big atom. But the question is, do you ever get to that atom when you're making your tiebreakers? So in this case, as we showed here, this has two C's and an H in its expanded structure. And down here, this has two H's and a C in, it, in its expanded structure. Well, right there, there's no tie, so that gives A the win. I never made it to I. So you have to be careful that you're not, you know, sucked into that trap of seeing the big atom, because if you never make it to the big atom, it's not going to play a role. Okay? And so that's, and and so you have to do that with all of them. If I had, you know, if I had an isopropyl group down here, versus 
the I with the CH2, CH2. If I put this in and we said isopropyl versus that CH2, this would still have two H's and a C attached to it, whereas the isopropyl would have two C's and an H. Isopropyl would win. And because we never make it to the I. So we've got, so we have to be careful that we always take a step back and follow the rules. The attached atom first, and then if there's a tie, what's attached to that atom. And you saw that I've kind of, I've tried, I've jumped ahead as well, and then said, no, 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 I need to go back, and I need to start with the atom, the four atoms. Or looking at the atoms first, and then look at the groups. So we have to determine one, two, three, and four. And there has to be clearly a one, two, three, and a four. There can't be any ties. So that's what the Conningo prelog rules set up. And then if you have a multiple bond, you replace that multiple bond with a multiple number of single bonds. So that's how we do part one. Right? We're only at part one. Okay, so let's do part two. And part two says that once I have number one, number two, number three, and number four, and here's a good example. So I've got an OH, an H, a CH3, and I've got an ethyl group CH3, CH2. So assigning the priorities here, which is which has been done. So I'm looking at an O, an H, a C, and a C. Is there clearly a number one of OH, C, and C? Yes, it's the oxygen. So this is group number one. Is there clearly a group number four? The hydrogen. And hydrogen will always be number four if it's there. It will always be number four. As a matter of fact, if I replace the hydrogen with a with a deuterium, which is a hydrogen of mass of two, hydrogen is still the lowest priority. So hydrogen is always the lowest priority. So then CH3 versus CH2, CH3, which one should be number two? <coughs> Ethyl or methyl? Ethyl, we agree. Okay, if we go back to the basics, C versus C, what's attached to this C? Two H's and a C, what's attached to that C? Three H's, what wins? Carbon. So this is number two, and this is number three. Okay. So once you get the numbers in play, it's just simply a question of numbers. As a matter of fact, I could, I could simplify this and do this. Number one, number two, number three, and number four. I don't even know what, I don't even need to know what the groups are once I get the numbers in place. So now, step two. Because again, this was just step one. Step two is going to be that I need to orient this molecule so that the fourth priority group is pointing away from me. So what position is pointing away from me? Four because it's on a dashed line. So any, the dashed line is always pointing away from you. So I need to put the fourth priority group on a dashed line. Well, in this case, the fourth priority group is on the dashed line, so I don't have to do anything. So now I'll skip ahead, and then we'll come back as what happens if number four isn't on a dashed line. So in this case, 
if the once the group is oriented so it's away from you there's now two possibilities going from number one to number two to number three is either clockwise or counterclockwise so I'm going to start at number one go to number two and go to number three after number four is put on a dash wedge in this case this was counterclockwise counterclockwise is S clockwise is R so if going from one to two to three is clockwise that is R. If going from 1 to 2 to 3 is counterclockwise, that is S. So the third or four on the other side, you would go the opposite way? If number 4 is somewhere else, I've got to make that molecule look like that. So that's what we need to do now. So I'm just saying once 4 is once four is on a dash wedge away from you, then you go 1, 2, 3, either clockwise or counterclockwise. But now we've got to go back and say, well, what if number four is not is not away from me? What do I have to do? No, no, no. My question is, where number four is located right now? Is it out? Is is behind? You. Right. Say we put it behind on the left side. It won't matter. Once it's on a dash wedge. No, I'm just saying as far as the counter clockwise, clockwise. Oh, if number four was over here, right? You just go the clockwise way. No, it's the same. It would be the same. Because once number four is pointed away from you. It, it doesn't play a role anymore. So let me see. Here's my, my crappy technique. And here's number four away from me. We, in the old chemistry books, like when I took this thing, we had the steering wheel model. So what we would do is we would take the four group and we would grab it and we would make it look like a steering wheel. Okay, an old steering wheel. Right? Because well, new steering wheels don't look like this. Because they got airbags and radio controls and everything else. But this is an old time steering wheel. So once you take the fourth group and you put it away from you, then it's either one, two, three clockwise or one, two, three counterclockwise. Now whether the fourth group is like away from you off at this angle, like it is on the board, or whether it's off at that angle, it's irrelevant. Because once it's on the dash line, you just go You start at one, you ignore four, you start at one and go from number one to number two to number three. And if that's a counterclockwise rotation, then it's S. If, it, if I went from one to two to three, like if I switched two and three, I would go from one to two to three, and that would be clockwise. Not necessarily. Well, all, what I'm really concerned about is just putting four on the dashed wedge. So this, if if I had the the wedge over here, if I had it written like this, and four was behind me, and I went from one to two to three, it would still be counterclockwise. It would still be S. So once four is on a dashed line, forget about it. And then just draw a circle from one to two to three. So that's where the R and the S came from. So I started by saying the configuration of each chiral center is either R or S. These are the sequence rules that we have to follow to determine explicitly if it's R or S. Sign four groups, number one to number four. Put four away from me on a dashed wedge and then go from number one to two to three, clockwise R, counterclockwise S. And what becomes a little bit, what becomes sort of an exercise in spatial thinking is going to be how do I orient the molecule so that four is away from me if it's not at the beginning. So let's say that Let's say I had that one. So 
I assign my priorities because again, it's about numbers. Once you get one, two, three, and four assigned, then it's just simply orienting number four away from me. So if I had this structure, I have to physically move four to the dashed wedge. Okay. My tetrahedron in my tetrahedron here, if I look at that, let's say I have something that looks like this. So this is in the plane of the board. This is in the plane of the board. Number one is pointing away from me and number four, or number three. So three is pointing towards you. One is, or um, one is away. Four is in the plane and two is in the plane. So what I need to do is I need to move this group right here behind me. So you could imagine me picking up this molecule like this and rotating it to put four in the back. So on paper, here's what I do. I say, there's my hand grabbing number two, and I can rotate four into the back, one into three, and three into four. And two doesn't move because it's the one I grabbed. So if I do that, four goes in the back, one comes up front, three goes to the side, and two never changed. So now I have that as my, as my same geometry. So I just grabbed two, and I rotated one into three, three into four, and four into one like this. Grab it, rotate it, back. Now four is behind me on the dashed wedge. And so going from one to two to three in this case is, going from one to two to three is counterclockwise, and so this was the this is the S configuration. But you can't do the S configuration, you can't determine R and S until you put the fourth group away from you. If you, if you just try and do one to two to three without the fourth group being away from you, you're gonna get, you're gonna get it wrong 50% of the time. If you get it right 50% of the time, if that's good enough for you then, but you're gonna get it wrong 50% of the time. Now, I'm having a sense of deja vu. I have it a lot. Because I'm like, wait. When I'm rotating one into three, three into four, and four into one, did we do anything like that in the past couple of days? Your deja vu senses are, they'll get better as we go along. What did I do? Grabbed it, rotated it like this, right? Okay, let me do that again. Not the chair, the Newman projections. So that's what I did with the Newman projection. Only now I'm doing it with the groups down. You have fours at the top? Okay. Right. So if I have this, oops. So fours here, let's say one, two, and three. 
Okay, so I want to I want to rotate four into the back. So I want to rotate four into one. So if I want to rotate four into one, I have two choices. What was going to be your choice? I want to move four into one. So what atom should I grab? One is the only one I can't grab because that's where I want the four group to go. And I can't grab four. So two or three. Do them both. So let's grab two. Right, so let's grab two. If I grab two, then I can move four into one, one into three, and three into four. So then, again, nothing is changed here in terms of the orientation of those bonds. It's just now four goes here, one, nope, sorry, two I grabbed and so it can't move, so I moved four into one, one came over here, and three goes up there. So now I've oriented four away from me. So I could grab two and I could rotate it, or let's say I grab three, so if I grab three, I should probably just rewrite it down here. So now I can grab three, and if I grab three, I'm going to move four into one, one into two, and two into four. So that now three didn't move, four is away from me, one moved where two was, and two moved where four was. So for a tetrahedron, that's how we can think about it spatially in terms of how we can rotate number four into the dashed wedge. And so that, and, and you could do this a number of different ways. If I had, for instance, if, if I go back to that where four is on top, if you can, if you have, you know, really good spatial sense, you could look at that molecule, you could look at this and say, okay, I'm going to picture myself underneath this molecule, looking up, and now four is away from me. And as I'm looking up, I've got to figure out where's one, two, and three in terms of being clockwise or counterclockwise. Or if four was over here, you can imagine yourself over here, would it be clockwise or counterclockwise? So if you have those kind of spatial abilities, you can imagine yourself in different places around the molecule. If you don't, then you would grab an atom and rotate it. If you don't have those spatial abilities, then there's a way that we can do it without having, with having no spatial ability sense. And this is only in the, in the organic chemistry for dummies one, or stereochemistry for dummies chapter. It's the only place I found it documented because I think people who write organic textbooks look down on this method because it doesn't involve having spatial sense and part of organic is to develop spatial sense so it's kind of it's not cheating but it's it kind of defeats the purpose but I don't care you, you can use any one of these methods that works great for you so here is what we call group switching I need no spatial sense here to do this but I need to understand the rules so group switching is a way to rotate the molecule without actually rotating it, which doesn't make any sense, but it works. So here's, here's what I know. I, I'm, when I group switch, when I group switch, I'm gonna move two, I'm gonna switch two groups at a time. So for instance, with this molecule right here, I can switch two groups at a time. What's going to be my first switch? 
in this molecule right here. If I get to switch two groups, what two groups should I switch first? What's my goal? My goal is to put four on the dashed wedge. So what should I switch? Switch one and four. So I, I'm going to switch one and four. So I just switched two groups. I just did one group switch. But here's the rules. The rules are that if you switch two groups at a time and you only do an odd number of switches. And I'm assuming that when you do your odd number of switches, you're putting four on the dashed wedge. You will get the opposite configuration that you started with. So if you do an odd number of switches and one is odd, so if you do one switch and put four on the dashed wedge, whatever I determine the configuration to be right now, RRS, it's wrong because I did one switch, which means I switched it from the original configuration. So if I do this now, whatever I get, I need to write down the opposite answer. Because I just switched the configuration from the original one. And that works for some people. Do one switch, write down the opposite answer. If that does not work for you, how do I get it back into the same configuration that I started with? You do an even number of switches. So when you do an even number of switches, When you do an even number of switches, you get the same configuration as the beginning. So if, you, if, so if it started as R, you do two switches, you determine it's R, that's what it was to begin with. So what I like to do, because I have, we have too many opposites, like in chemistry, so it's better just to remember this straightforward instead of opposite, is I usually do two switches. So I just did one. My first switch is to get four behind me. Then my second switch can be any of those two. If I'm smart though, I don't move four. Right, so now I can switch any of the other two groups. The first, you know, the first absurd example I give you is Oh, I'll switch four and one, then I'll switch them again. I'm back to where I started. I didn't change the configuration. Again, determine it, but I didn't change it. How about I switch? So I switch four and one, that is Uno switch. Now I need to do two. I need to do a second. What do you want to switch? Your choice. That's the one I don't want to switch because now I'm back to the beginning. So anything but one and four. Mm -hmm. Two and one. Okay, so I'm going to switch two and one, which I didn't do here. I switched. There. So now I've got one, four, two, three. I did two switches, so whatever configuration I determine right now, that's the same as what it started. So fours away from me going from one to two to three is counterclockwise and so this is S. So the original molecule started out as S and when I did my two switches it's still S. So group switching let me rotate that molecule without rotating it. And again, that is something that a purist organic chemist would go, well no, we can't do that without any spatial reasoning. And so they don't put it in their books. I did not come up with this. I have no idea where I, where I learned this. Maybe in the old books they snuck it in, but 
somehow when I first started teaching, I'm like, wait, I think there's group switching. And I looked in every book and I couldn't find it until this Organic Chemistry for Dummies book came out. There is a volume two. There was, for the longest time, there was only volume one. Hannah? No, and that's the next thing we need to talk about, is what happens when I have multiple chiral centers. But I'm going to use this technique to determine the R and the S for every single molecule. But I'm going to make them more complicated here. Um, right now, it's just a single chiral center in two in the two in the plane, a bold and a dashed. I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that in a minute or two. So those are our. So those are the three steps. Number one, one, two, three, four. Number two, orient the molecule so that four is on a dashed wedge. And notice I keep saying a dashed wedge. You might say, well, right now there's only been one dashed wedge. That means there's more with dashed wedge coming. And number three then, once I've oriented the fourth group, one to two to three is either clockwise or counter. So that's how we determine R and S for a chiral center. But right now it's pretty boring because it's just this one chiral center. So let's do this. So group switching replaces if you don't want to rotate the molecule. The group switching is a way to rotate it without ever rotating it. But as long as you switch two groups twice, as long as you switch a set of two groups an even number of times, then and number four is on the dashed wedge, you will get the same answer as the molecule started out with, the same configuration. So a lot of times group switching is faster. Because you can just go switch, switch. But the, the thing is, everybody has their own system, right? And since everybody has their own system, the way that you're going to learn what system works for you is to do some practice problems. And so that's what you want to do, is to do the practice problems. Because that will tell you exactly what. If you, get, if you do the practice problems and you get them all right, good. If you get them all wrong, you have a choice. Either figure out what you're doing or just keep doing them wrong and then writing down the opposite answer. If you're consistently wrong, but the most deadliest part is if you're like 50-50, because what that means is you're doing something in that series of three steps wrong. Some of the time. So sometimes it's the numbering scheme, sometimes it's the conversion, sometimes it's the clockwise counterclockwise. And I'm, I imagine there will come a day when clockwise and counterclockwise doesn't quite, you know, we, we already don't, we already don't have a lot of those clocks, right? And I think they're teaching kids to do digital clocks. So there will come a time when we don't even have a clockwise counterclockwise. People will be like, what's that? I'll either be retired or dead, one of the two, when that comes around. So that's what we need to do. So here's, um, so on the screen here is, are the problems that are number two in the, in the folder, so practice problems. So um, we'll take a break here, and when we come back, let's, do number F. Let's do number F. And then I'll pull you, and then I'll pull you to see what you got. Okay. So let's figure about 17 or 18 after, then we'll. 
and then I'll then I'll pull you. So take a break, come back, work on it. You can check your answer with your neighbor if you want, or you can work on it with your neighbor, and then we'll go A, or, and then I'll say, is it R or S? And then we'll pull you and see if everybody gets it right. And if not, then we'll have to go through how to do that. Okay, so I'm going to pause this. Pause. Okay, so for F, do we have it as R or S? So let's call R A and let's call S B. What? Yeah. So you need a minute or two more? Okay. But F. F. So is F R or S? Yes. The C H D B R. A is R and B is S. Anybody else have an answer? Yeah, just out for better thing. Okay, let's see what we got. We got six. We got a four and six. Four R's and S and six S's. All right, so let's go through and figure out what group is what. So of the groups, which one is number one? 
OH. Okay, so the OH is number one. What group is number two? I think that's way too. Yeah. So group number one is the OH. Group number two. CH2BR? CH2I? Okay, so CH2I is number two. CH2BR? Three. And double bond number four. Nine times out of a ten, a C double bond O is not going to be four. But in this case, it is. Because of the halogen on the other groups. So I've got one, two, three, four. Now, when they do this, take a step back. Is four oriented away from you? Yes. Well, sometimes what will happen is you'll get so used to group switching that you'll switch to four out of the good position. So you've got to take a step back. Is four away from you? Yes. So now I just go to one, two, and three, and one, two, and three is yes. It's kind of clockwise, so it's nice. So, if you don't get the numbers right, you may get the problem wrong, and I mean, may get it right wrong because you could always get it right still. You could mess up in the orientation, still maybe get the problem right, maybe not, and then of course forget which is clockwise and counterclockwise, and maybe get it wrong. So there's no, so there's. You know, this is why when you're doing problems, if you're getting a 50-50, you're doing something wrong in each one of those problems, and then you go back and figure out what it is. Because sometimes doing it wrong won't affect the answer, sometimes doing it wrong will. So, what kinds of molecules can I do then? These, are, these kinds of tetrahedron are pretty straightforward at least in terms of what else we're going to do. So, in terms of the Conningle pre sequence rules, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of a diversion back to Al... Well, no, I won't do alkenes yet. Maybe we'll do that at the end here. But what other molecules, what other orientations of molecules do we have to be able to do R and S in? So, for instance, there is a way to orient the molecule into a structure that looks like this. This is called a Fisher projection. Now you may say, where's the bold and the dashed wedges? And when you're in a Fisher projection, the two positions that are horizontal are bold so that they're pointing at you, and the two positions vertical are away from you. And so in a Fisher projection, it's understood that they are bold and dashed. Bold, horizontal, vertical, dashed. I call these bow tie structures because the bow tie is horizontal pointing towards you. I know where I got that one. I got that from an Apple IIe organic tutorial program when I was in college. The Apple IIe is the one with the green screen. It's like 30 years ago. Right? They're probably worth they're probably worth big bucks if you had one now, but or not, because nobody ever because what are you gonna use them for? But back in the day, that's how they that's how they reminded people that a Fisher projection was a bow tie structure. So two of the positions will be towards you, and the other two positions will be away from you. If I have my model, these two are towards you, 
and these two are away from you. Now, a Fisher projection is actually not too terribly bad to determine R and S for because, remember the rule is you've got to put the number four group on a dashed wedge. You've got two dashed wedges. Does it matter which one you put it on? No. So let's say I had a, an, an H, no, a CH3, an H, a CL, and an OH here. And I said, what is that, R or S? Okay, so we have to assign our numbers first, right? Everybody have their numbers assigned? What's number one? CL? Agree? CL's number one. Number two. OH, we agree with that. Number three. Three, it's three. Number four. Okay. Uh, number four, is it pointing away from you? No. How am I going to get number four away from me? Well, for Fisher projections, Group switching is usually the easiest way to do this. There's something that you should never do with Fisher projections. Again, when I tell you what never to do, somebody's going to hear me as do that. No, you do not do this. You cannot take a Fisher projection and rotate it like a steering wheel. Yes? You sort of need to get it around now. That's the way you got to do it. Yeah, you've got to grab one of those two, and you got to grab one of the bonds and then rotate it. But what you can't do, and in, if you read in the book, they'll tell you don't ever do this. You can't like grab number three and one and rotate it like a steering wheel. You cannot do that because that's not the way the molecule is oriented. But if I wanted to, I could grab, for instance, I could say let's grab number two. And if I grab number two, what's going to happen? I'd want to move, well, I can move four either up or down. So let's just move it this way. I'm going to move four into one, one into three, and three into four. So you could grab two, you could even grab one if you wanted to and rotate four into three, three into two, and two into four. If I did that, then Two will not move, four goes down here, one comes up here, three goes there. Four is now on a dashed wedge, so it's away from me. So now I don't worry about it, I just go from one to two to three. And if I go from one to two to three, it's counterclockwise, and so that configuration is S. And so the original molecule's configuration is S. And if you're thinking, well, we haven't done any R molecules yet, I'm just making up problems. And I'll be making up problems next Monday, from next Monday too. So if you're saying, well, it's not, there's not a nice even 50-50, I have to sit down really hard to make that work. Whereas if I just whip the problems off in my head, I have no idea what they will be. Chances are they won't be all one letter. Although that would be that would be interesting if it was. It would be easy to trade. They were all like R. But that's not gonna happen. So in a Fisher projection then, that's that's the way that we can handle it is 
we just have to put that the four position on one of the two dash lines. So again, once I determine one, two, three, and four, it's a it's a numbers game. Trying to make the numbers match or make the number four go on the dash ledge. So that's another way of representing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk not like that. We're gonna look at structures like this where basically that's a Fisher projection with both of the horizontals, these being bold, these ones being dashed, and then usually the position in the middle is we consider in the plane of the board. And in this one, I can rotate the groups like this. Bless you. I can rotate the groups like that around. And the thing with that structure is that that is a human projection on its side. So that as I'm rotating those groups around, it's like I'm rotating the human projection. And if I looked at it from here, I'd see a normal projection. In this case, I would see an eclipsed Newman projection because both of these four groups being bold are going to be in the same plane and eclipsing each other. So that's another way to look at it. But now I have two chiral centers. And so we're going to take a step back and not necessarily do the two chiral centers yet. I still want to focus on one. So the Newman or so Fisher projections are another way to represent the molecules. Cyclohexanes. I've got two chiral centers now, so I guess I have no choice but to determine the R and the S configuration of these two chiral centers in the in the cyclohexane conformation. Now I want to change my cyclohexane into something with two bonds in the plane, a bold and a dashed wedge. You might say, can I do, can I look at this structure and could I put bold and dashed wedges into this cyclohexane? And the answer is yes, but you better be very good at spatial seeing. And you'll need to know that for all of the positions, so you'll need to know like six times the information. Right? So you're going to have to memorize six different things. You may not have space up here for six different things, and something's going to get kicked out. Hopefully it's just some worthless trivia instead of important organic stuff. So how can I put this cyclohexane into something with bold and dashed wedges? Well. Let's imagine that I'm on top of the molecule looking down at it. And I'm going to put numbers in here just so we know where our, our orientation is. And normally I would say, remember like three weeks ago when we talked about cyclohexanes? And it's more like five days. So what I'm going to do is, when I look down on my cyclohexane ring, it's going to look like this. And the numbering scheme, I'm just showing you how it would translate. So the one is in the upper right-hand position. The number one in the flat cyclohexane is in the upper right-hand position. 
So let me ask you this question. Number one is going to have a bold wedge and a dashed wedge. What's bold represent? Hydrogen, it's the bold wedge is representing groups that are towards you, and if I'm on top of the ring, that means the groups that were above the plane of the ring. And in this case, what group is above the plane of the ring attached to carbon one? Hydrogen. What's the group below the plane of the ring? The chlorine. For two, what should be on the bold wedge? Methyl. Methyl's above the plane of the ring, and what's below? The bromine. So my recommendation is when you have cyclohexanes, Let's look at it from above the plane of the ring and convert it into a basically what would be a flat cyclohexane. It's not flat, but for the sake of stereochemistry, we've got groups above and below the plane of the ring. And so this feeds into last week when we were talking about all the positions, which ones were above, which ones were below. Now you might say, well, that's going to be really messy to figure out the R and the S. Okay? Let's break the molecule up. So I'm going to look at carbon 1. I'm going to write the bold and dashed wedges in exactly the same orientation that I just did. But I'm going to basically pull it out of the ring. And now I'm going to put my groups on there, number one, number two. Okay. So for carbon one, what's group number four? The hydrogen is number four. And that's going to then go where the hydrogen is. Oops. Hydrogen up here is group number four, so I'm going to go ahead and put the four there. Stop. This is why I don't like to use the slideshow mode, because, the, because it has a mind of its own and it keeps going back and forth. What's number one? So up here I've got a carbon a carbon, a hydrogen, and a chlorine. Sales number one. Okay. So number one goes there. Step. Okay, so now we got to put two and three in. Well, there's only one way to do this, and that's go back to basics. So carbon versus carbon, tie, right? What's attached to this carbon right here? Carbon number six. Two H's and a, and the carbon that's over here, number five. So that's two H's and a C. What's attached down here to this carbon? Carbon and a bromine, and over here, another carbon. So down here we've got two C's and a BR. What wins? The BR wins it, so this is number two and this is number three. So I pulled carbon one out and I've now assigned groups 
I've now assigned number one to number four. Okay, so what should I do now? Well, the beauty of this is I put this into a tetrahedron, right? So whatever way you use to determine R and S for a tetrahedron, you can now use with this. So if you wanted to grab number two and rotate four into one and one into three and three into four, you could do that. You could grab number three and rotate four into one, one into two, and two into four. Or you could just do this. Switch one and four, switch two and three, two switches, fours away from me, going from one to two to three is still counterclockwise. Another S. So by taking the cyclohexane and making it flat and then pulling that carbon out, I've made it just another tetrahedron problem. So then my question to you is, and I'm going to rewrite the structure down here, because that's the problem is it gets, when you do the first one, then it, if, you, if you do it in a different color, I suppose you could do it in another color, but it's going to get really, really messy. So what I like to do is I just like to rewrite it, and now I'm going to work on carbon two. Actually, sorry, you're going to work on carbon two. So now for carbon two here, I want to know is it RS? So I want to. So I want to know. I'll give give you a couple minutes. I want. I'm going to pull you. Is this carbon now? Is that an R?
get it, right? So same thing. So looking at that, again, if I pull, if I pull it out, what group is, what group is number one in this carbon? What group is number one? Bromine, two. Left, right, up. Three. Four. Right. So there's my initial numbers. Any questions about those? All right, so now I've got to put four behind me so I can switch, so I could switch um, four and one, switch two and three, and if I do that now going from 1 to 2 to 3 is finally R. All right, so for cyclohexanes, that's what I'm going, you know, I can give you a cyclohexane either as a flat cyclohexane or as a chair. My recommendation is if you see it as a chair, make it flat. Because then you can deal with, you can deal with it as as you would any tetrahedron. So, regular tetrahedron, Fischer projection, then a tetrahed, then a um, chair cyclohexane. So it's so that's those are three of the different structures you you can do R and S for. There's one more. And I, so let's say I give you this structure. And I'll give you an H here, a CH3 here. A CL there, let's put an H here, a CH3 here, and a CL here. And I, and I asked you, okay, let's determine R and S for that Fisher projection. So both the horizontals are going to be bold wedges. That, Carbon H, carbon methyl group is going to be dashed wedges, and then I usually keep the center vertical bond is in the plane. So let's take the top carbon out and let's put it into a let's put it into its Fisher projection. Or if you don't like the the other orientation of the Fisher projection, would be just simply to say there's a vertical line. So you always have, unless you're missing a digit, 
from your hand, you always have a Fisher projection with you. Right? Because here's the bond down, here's the three. So you can rotate them. So let's see what so of the for this carbon on top, what is the number four group? H number one group. Chlorine would be number one. Okay, now if I'm looking at the other two groups, the CH3 versus now the CH3 versus the whole bottom part of the molecule. So if I'm looking at this, I'm going C versus C. What's attached to this C up here? Three H's. What's attached to this C down here? How about more than three H's? Because it's got an H, a CL, and a carbon. So more than three H's. So number two, number three. Fourth group pointing away from me? Yes. One to two to three is? R. So the top carbon is R. Okay, so the new thing about this and it's not really new is that when you do a Fisher projection, a lot of times when you start out, it's like, well, okay, I've got this carbon, but what should I do with the stuff down here? The stuff down there is one big entire group. So you just treat it as an entire group. So now if we take the bottom carbon, what's the bottom carbon going to have? What's number four? Or what's number one? CL's number one. Hydrogen is number four. Now, given CH3 and the rest of the top group, which one is number two? All the top stuff. And what's number three, the methyl? Number four group away from me? No. How am I going to get it there? Didn't I shut that off? Okay. So you could group switch this if you'd like. Switch four and three, one and two. If I want to rotate, how am I going to rotate this? If I'm going to rotate this, I'm going to grab number two and I'm going to rotate four down three up and one across. So if I wanted to rotate that, four goes there, three goes there, one goes there, two goes there. Is four now away from me? Yes. Going from one to two to three is what? Clockwise and so that, in this case, both chiral centers in this molecule are ours. So every chiral center gets an R and S. And so that this type of a Fisher projection with now two chiral centers instead of one is a newer molecule, but again, we can handle it the same way. So what's the last molecule we have to do RNS for? Well, let's go back to last week. We did cyclohexanes, right? We could do that. It would basically, you pull every carbon out of the bicyclic system. But how about Newman projections? How do you do a Newman projection? So 
So let's put an H here, a CL here, and a CH3 here. And then just for the sake of fun, let's put a CH3, an H, and a CL on the back carbon. Tomorrow we'll have to determine whether or not that molecule is a meso compound, but for the moment, what's the configuration of the front carbon? What's the configuration of the back carbon? Well, let's convert this Newman projection. There's two things we could do. We can convert this Newman projection into a Fisher projection. But sometimes I think it might be easier to convert this Newman projection into a sawhorse. Now, to remember what the sawhorse was, we have to go back to last week. <coughs> Fortunately, it wasn't that long ago, but still, it, it, it was a while. So, a sawhorse is this. Or, that. So I guess my first question is this. What kind of Newman projection do I have? Staggered or eclipsed? Staggered? Okay, so if I'm gonna turn this staggered Newman projection into a sawhorse, I have to turn it into the sawhorse that is also staggered. So the question would be, which one is that? Is that A or is that B? And you can just give me an answer if you'd like. You can shout it out, be bold. B? Do we agree with B? Anybody want to go for A? Nobody wants to go for A? It's B. Now why is that? Because you can see an A, remember that was kind of the U-shaped. Last week I said I, I use as my visual cue the bonds that are in the plane of the screen or in the paper. So when it's U-shaped, this is eclipsed. And when I'm and when they're sort of S-shaped, that's gonna be oh look at that. If it's S shaped, it's gonna be staggered. So S S. A new mnemonic, I believe. So, it's staggered. Last week when we looked at this, we said, okay, the Newman projection is when I look down that end. So when I look down that end, what do I see? I see a straight up position on the front carbon, straight down position on the back carbon. But now if I'm looking at the Newman projection, how do I go from Newman projection to staggered? I'm going to picture myself over here looking at the molecule from the right side. If I do that, what's the front carbon? Is the front carbon the left carbon or is the front carbon the right carbon? Left? So if I'm looking at it this way, so the Newman project, and you also have, you have a Newman projection with you too. Here's my, here's my Newman projection. Except, yeah, except the two fingers are the, my, the rest of my hand is the upward and downward. So if I'm looking at that, and I want to go to the side, which I'm like this, the front carbon now became 
the left carbon. So this is the front carbon, that's the back carbon. In, in today's folder, there's actually a video on how to go from the go from the Newman into a Fisher projection as well. There's a video for that. Occasionally I'll get students from other schools that are apparently going on YouTube to learn their organic. They'll send me some message about it was helpful or not helpful. They're from other schools, I mean. But they'll they'll give me some feedback. And then they'll tell me I should I should order all my videos according to topic, and I'm like, you don't go here, so I'm not going to take the time to change from dates to topics. Somebody did that once, and then they monetized it, and I told them my legal team would be in touch with them if they didn't take it off the web. They just took my videos and made them their own. They did say John Carroll University, and then they, then they put ads on it to monetize it, and I said, yeah, no, you're not doing that. I didn't even have to get my legal team involved. So, and you will find some pretty good stuff on, on YouTube, but the, the video will take you that way. But what I found is there's no sense in going to a Newman, or going from Newman to Fisher when we can break this sawhorse projection up into our two bold dashed wedges and then we can just figure it out from there. So, what goes where then? So on the front carbon, what goes on the position that's in the plane, that's up in the position? What atom? H. H is there. Then what goes on the dashed wedge that would be pointing behind you if you're looking at it on the side? Cl. What would be on the front position? CH3. Okay. Now on the back carbon, what position is in the plane straight down. CL. And then what goes on the bold position that is pointing towards you? The H. And what goes on the dashed position? The CH3 is now, the CH3, if you're here, the CH3 is behind you. So let me erase the B. It's being in my way. So then what I've done now is I've converted the fish, the uh, Newman projection into a, into a sawhorse. So now if I wanted to determine R and S, let's just break this up and say, okay, here's my left carbon. And then I would say, okay, now that I've broken that up, I'm going to break up over here. I'm going to break up the carbon on the right. So now I just need to put my groups in by numbers. So of HCl, CH3 and the whole right hand side of the molecule, what's number one? Cl is number one. Number four? H. Of CH3 and the whole right side of the molecule, what's number two? The whole right side of the molecule and then CH3 is Three. If I go to the right side of the molecule, now that I've split that up, what's number one? Chlorine, number four of these groups, H. Methyl versus the whole left hand side. Whole left hand side beats methyl. So now I've taken and I've converted my Newman into a sawhorse and I've taken my sawhorse and I've split it in half so now I can do the left side which was the front, the right side which is the back. And so for the left, the front carbon, what was its, what's its configuration R or S? S? I'm going to switch groups because four is not away from me. So now I'm going from one to two to three is counterclockwise or S. If you wanted to, you could grab two and rotate four into one, one into three, 
and 3 into 4. It doesn't matter. Let me just write that. Let me just write that. So you could also grab 2, grab 2 with your hand, rotate 4 into 1, 1 into 3, and 3 into 4. And if you did that, guess what you're doing? You're rotating the front carbon just like we did last week in a Newman projection. How about carbon? How about the right hand carbon? Is four pointed away from me? No, in this case I might want to grab two and move four into three, three into one, one into four. So now what do I end up with? I end up with a one on top, a four there, a three there. So going now from 1 to 2 to 3 is, yes, so that's counterclockwise. So the front carbon's configuration is S, the back carbon's configuration is S. So that's how we determine the configurations of chiral centers including all the possibilities that I could give you. So what my recommendation is, is I'm sure they give you these kinds of problems in the Top Hat textbook, but also if I go back here to, so this is from today's, let me go, let me go back and show you exactly So in today's folder, might even be yes. Let's see where it is. If it's today or yesterday's folder. Um, okay, that's this is today's folder. So in yesterday's folder, there are practice problems. There's the stereochemistry for dummies text that'll can explain more about. Well, it puts it on paper. The group switching approach. But there are practice problems for October 7th. And then there are practice problems for October 8th. If you look at the practice problem, and again, the dates are off, but I haven't updated the dates for the summer. And this is probably October 8th, like 2013 or something like that. But problem set number one is a chiral center where you have to determine one, two, three, and four. Problem set number two is that same set, only now it's asking you for R and S. And problem set number three are a series of four groups, and you've got to rank them from one to four. So three different ones. Problem set number two is the one that I showed you with the R and S that we've been doing some problems from. All of these have an answer key for them. So if you click on the answer key, it will download it. If you open it up, it will give you the answer key. I don't believe this answer key has narration to it, but it will give you the answer keys as to what the priorities are, and then I usually group switch with those. If, you, if this, when it came up, would have had something up here that said that there was a pen cast associated with it, that pen cast is the narrated answer key. And the way you get at that is that you make sure you have the latest Adobe um, PDF reader, and then you download that file onto your computer and then open it up with the PDF reader. And then at the bottom you'll get a little play button so that when you hit the play button, there'll be a, a sort of a green dot and it'll play audio as it writes. And there's a way to click off of so that you don't see what's being written ahead of time. And you can take the green button and you can move it to any of the problems. So that's what that's the way the narrated answer key goes. Okay, so and this one doesn't appear this one doesn't have a narrated answer key. Um, but some of the other ones do. 
So then this will give you more practice, particularly this sheet, because there's a grand total of L number of problems on here. The problems that I put in for today's, into today's folder for R and S, some of these are straightforward. Some of them get pretty wickedly hard. Um, so I would, I would first of all look at these problems to make sure you've got R and S under control, but then for um, for the R and S problems, I guess they're in today's folder. You've got some. We've got some uh, more interesting problems. So there is one, two, three chiral centers and fructose. And let me just say say one thing about the way this molecule's oriented. The way the molecule's oriented when it's oriented in this zigzag structure, the question off the question is, so here's my bold wedge. And where should I, so I'll come back here. If you have a zigzag structure and you've got a bold wedge here, where should the dashed wedge go? I can tell you where it doesn't go, but I'll show you where it does. It always goes there. Because if you looked at that zigzag structure, two of the bonds would be like this and the other two bonds would be like this. So when you're looking at them, one's behind the other. So that is the way a zigzag structure, that's what the way the bold and dashed and in the planes go. Does it matter if the bold is on the left and the dashed is on the right pointing up? Does it matter if the bold is on the left or right? No. You'll get the same answer whether the dashed wedge is to the right or to the left. The critical part is it's got to be up. It's, they have to be going in the same direction. If they go in opposite directions, you will get the wrong answer. So this is the way a zigzag structure has to be oriented. Right, so, so if you're doing this, you would just all you're concerned about is that. So you so if you take this if you take that carbon out and then just determine one, two, three, and four, you can do that tetrahedron anyway works for you. But there are some zigzag structures in here and that's they're always like this, they're always on the same side. And if you looked at this, if you looked at this structure on its side, you can see that's what we've been using as a tetrahedron. Okay. So there are tons of problems, and they get more complicated from there. Um, save the rings for last, because that's those will test your tie-breaking rules. Because you might have to go like way down the line to, to break the ties. But some of these, like a chair, there's an example of a chair. So there's lots of problems on here um, for you to practice on. And again, as you're practicing, if you're getting them all right, great. If you're getting them 50-50, that means something is going wrong. And, you're, and it's, that something is sometimes doesn't affect and sometimes it does. And if you're getting them all wrong, uh, you probably should come and see me. And, we, and I can go over, you can do the problem, and I'll go over what, and try and figure out what you're, what you're constantly doing wrong. So tomorrow we are, tomorrow I will load up the assignment. Um, I haven't done that already, but for tomorrow we, so, so let me, let's take a look at that real quick and see. What are we doing tomorrow? All right, uh, stop. Just let me go back. 
Today we did six. We we're still in chapter six. We have to go back to the beginning of chapter six and talk about cis trans for alkenes and easy, but that's just a distraction right now from going through this. So let's see. Reading list. So today we did. So today we did um, six point. We did six point five, which was the nomenclature. So today we did six point five, six point six. Um, we did six point seven and six point eight yesterday, talking about optical activity, and we'll talk more about that. Um, an antimeric excess and racemic mixtures. We'll talk about. Um, tomorrow or Thursday. So we've done 6.5, 6, 6.6, 6, 6.7, 6, 6, 6, 6.8, 6, 6.10, 6, 6.11, and probably 6.13 because we did that yesterday. So then tomorrow we'll do, we'll finish everything else up. And we'll go back to chapter 6 and do alkenes, how to name alkenes, and the EZ nomenclature, because the EZ nomenclature uses the con angle pre sequence rules. So hopefully once you know those, then you're good. So you should do the rest of six. For tomorrow, yes. Okay. So that's it. Six. Sure. Okay. Yep. And we'll do an end of the beginning of chapter six with the outcomes. So that's what our plan is tomorrow. I will put that in the folder, in tomorrow's folder. I'll put all that in there. I will clean up today's to show exactly what we did. Um, that may not happen until like 3.30 today. Right, but if you have questions, email me, come see me. Otherwise, that's what we'll be doing tomorrow.